Number 10, Hercolytus. Hercolytus was an ancient Greek pre-Socratic philosopher. Little is known of Hercolytus' life, he wrote a single work, only fragments of which only survived. Critical of other philosophers, he had a dim view of humanity, he loved mobs and democracy, and preferred rule by a few wise men, a concept that Plato later distilled into the notion that the ideal ruler would be a philosopher king. He thought wealth was a form of punishment and wished upon his fellow Esphians, whom he hated, that they become wealthy as a punishment for their sins. He came to a weird end as a result of his affliction with dropsy or edema, a very painful accumulation of fluids beneath the skin and in the body's cavities. Doctors couldn't help him so the self-taught philosopher sought to apply his self-teachings to medicine and heal himself. Hercolytus tried to innovate a cure where he covered himself in cow dung and the reason was that the warmth of the manure would dry and draw out of him the noxious damp humor or the fluids accumulated beneath his skin. Number 9. Gerhard Leberscher von Blücher. If I butchered that name, my bad. Blücher was a head case and everybody knew it. However, he was still a great combat leader and for all of that, so his superiors would put up with his crazy and continued to steadily promote him up the ranks. He had beef with the Prussian monarch as he insulted him during his resignation, but when he tried to retire to be a farmer, he missed being out on the field and so he tried to enlist back. But the Prussian monarch remembers a face and he blocked him on all social media from ever DMing him ever again. It wouldn't be till 15 years later when the ban was finally lifted after the monarch had died and Butcher was able to get back into the war. This and also despite his extremely weird and bizarre behavior and his beliefs, among his nuttier delusion, which came and went over the years, he truly believed that a Frenchman had impregnated him. Hmm. As a result, for some time, Blitcher was convinced that he was going to give birth to a baby elephant at any time, at any moment even right now. Either way, he was still a key role in defending Napoleon in 1813 during the Battle of Leipzig, as his military tactics were incredible, so were the thoughts in his head. Which is why the military and the army still held on to him even though he was a pretty wacky guy. Even one army staff had said, he must lead even if he has a hundred elephants inside him, and I still love that so much. Number 8. George Gordon Byron At some point in our lives, we might be blessed with a hot steamy romance and if not, don't worry honey, it is coming. But for England's most infamous poet, Lord Byron, he was a sentimental kind of lover and he also had a very close intimate relationship with his own sister, where they also produced an offspring together. Nice. But despite his relationship with his sibling, he'd also have multiple relationships with different people. The flamboyant poet was always having an affair, especially one with a lady, Caroline Lamb, who at first didn't want anything to do with him, but she allowed his advances. When Byron dumped her, she turned into a stalker and pursued him relentlessly, which again, she was at peace before you met her, Byron, and so you should have just left her alone. Now you played yourself, didn't you? At that point, she broke into his house and wrote Remember Me all over his desk. Byron then decided to write a diss track, Wild and Out style, and had the poem called Remember Thee, Remember Thee. And it goes like this. Remember thee, remember thee, till leech quench life's burning steam. Remorse and shame shall cling to thee and haunt thee like a feverish dream. Remember thee, I doubt it not. Thy husband too shall think of thee. By neither shalt thou be forgot, thou false to him, thou fiend to me. Dang! Sorry. Anyways, he died after catching a fever in some Greek backwater at the age of 36. Number 7, Annalise Michael. Of course, I gotta mention Annalise Michael, and if you don't know her, you will now. She was the first ever recorded exorcism on tape, inspiring the renowned film The Exorcism of Emily Rose. She was ranked as one of the most extraordinary and odd cases up to date. In fact, her case has resonated so many skeptics, religious dogmatists, and even medical professions that it still begs the question, what happened to her? What happened to Annalise Michael? At the age of 16, she experienced multiple episodes of body compulsions and even though she was diagnosed with temporal lobed epilepsy which followed up with her experiences with symptoms like seizures, loss of memory and hallucinations, she was often given medication and practically did nothing. She would say that she would see the devil, hear demons in her head and she was damned and she would rot in hell and when her family sought out help from the church, priest Ernest Alt would then get a local bishop to consent an exorcism. Over the next 10 months they would conduct over 67 exorcisms on Michael and in these sessions Michael would then claim she was possessed by Lucifer, Cain, Judas, Adolf, and Nero. However, However, during these 10 months, her bodies would deteriorate from lack of eating, excessive prayer, which broke her knees, and she would die from malnutrition and dehydration. The priest and her parents were then imprisoned and charged for negligence for her death, as her case was very extraordinary, but regardless of what happened to her, it was still struck with tragedy and lasting consequences. Number 6. King Charles VI Even though he was noted as Charles the Well-Loved, he ascended the throne at 11 years old and his kingdom was governed by regents who were very good at their job. It was all changed when he took personal charge of France at the age of 21 and then he became Charles the Mad. To be fair, the king suffered a lot through mental illnesses, which of course during the years of 1368 to 1422 was not even a topic to think of, which then dubbed him as the Mad King. King Charles VI would then break into fits and tantrums and run wild through his home. He even forgot his own name and that he was the king and failed to 
to recognize his own wife or his children. Some modern scholars think he might have suffered from a psychotic break, which believes to be his first manifestation of schizophrenia, which then lead to sporadic violent episodes and periods of inertia and confusion for the rest of his life, which explains where he was convinced that he was made of glass and he would not move whatsoever. Psychological inertia is associated with apathy in a mental state in which sufferers lack the desire or energy to engage in any activity where intellectual or physical movements are required. The unfortunate monarch would then later and continue to slip in and out of his state until his death in 1422. Number 5. Hans Christian Andersen You may know this esteemed writer from his works like The Little Mermaid, The Ugly Duckling, Thumbelina, and many known fairy tales. And even though he's written so many amazing stories, there's no wonder his biography description doesn't extend as far as that. Now the stories he tells are generally sad ones with very hopeful endings, but his stories like The Ugly Duckling was actually based on his own upbringing when other boys would bully him. But hey, look at him! He's super famous with so many noted hits! But of course you're probably wondering why is he even on this list? Well. I never shame anyone on what they do in their time, after all it's your body, but historians have noted that he was a chronic self-toucher, if you catch my drift. In fact, he had a whole Google Calendar and Microsoft to-do list to track whenever he needed to pleasure himself. He even put it in his diary with a pair of plus signs whenever he went downtown on himself, and sometimes he'd even talk to adult workers, and if they reject him, he would just go back home and have a whole field day alone in his room. So if you ever saw this man's journal entries and saw a bunch of plus signs, you know that he was pretty busy that day. He was also the type of guy who also fed off of rejection, and so he would always reach out for the stars and write deep love letters to the women who rejected him. And when they did, he'd go home, essentially get into bed, and write some more plus lines. Now that's self-love. Number 4. Gloria Ramirez Gloria Ramirez's life was pretty normal, but the circumstances surrounding her bizarre death may have made her one of history's disturbing people, as well as disturbing cases in both true crime and medical. When she was taken to General Hospital in Riverside, California, she developed a drop of blood pressure, a rapid heart rate, and was unable to form coherent sentences. Ramirez was only 31 years old, and in the late stages of cervical cancer, she thought that was probably the cause of her symptoms. Doctors quickly got to work trying to save her life, but nothing seems to be working. And then when nurses removed Ramirez's shirt, they saw mysterious mysterious oily sheen on her skin and noted her mouth smelled pretty fruity garlicky. They took a blood sample and saw manila colored particles floating in it as well as her blood smelling alarmingly like ammonia. Suddenly, one after the other, nurses in the room started to faint. Others developed breathing problems and one nurse experienced paralysis and nobody knew why. Ramirez died that night and a special team came in to examine her body while wearing hazmat suits to protect themselves from whatever had taken down the nurses. Ramirez earned the name the Toxic Lady because no one could examine her body without exposing themselves to a wide range of medical problems. Still, no one knows why or how the night played out, and it still leaves scientists and medical professionals pondering to this day. Number 3. Carl Tanzler Gotta love true crime moment when it comes to history with Carl Tanzler's twisted mentality, as he is definitely going to be mentioned here on this list. He was a physician who lived a pretty normal life until he found love with his patient, Maria Elena Mila Grodi Hoyos. She was a 22-year-old Cuban-American woman who was brought to the Florida hospital where Tanzler worked. To him, it was literally love at first sight. When he was young, he had a dream a dark-haired woman was destined to be his true love and was convinced Hoyos must be that woman. He really felt like he manifested her. Anyways, TB or tuberculosis is still a deadly disease disease that affects the lungs and causes pneumonia, but that didn't stop Carl from professing his love and showering her with gifts. He was her main care provider, and he would take care of her as much as long as she lived. But unfortunately, she did pass away after a few months later, and Carl was heartbroken. With her parents' blessing, Tanzler purchased an expensive mausoleum for Maria to be buried in, but once her body was locked in, it was apparent that Carlos was the only one that had the key. So for seven years, he kept her body at his house and would practically dress her corpse up like a doll, use plaster, coat hangers, and wires to preserve her body. Hmm. Her family found out and he was then arrested, but then due to statue of limitations of his crime, he was let go. Number 2. Hetty Green During the years of the Civil War, millionaires could get away with almost any eccentric behavior. I mean, even now they can still do it. No one's stopping them. Born the daughter of a prosperous family in 1837, Hetty Green was thriving, but it wasn't until she married another rich man that she really blew up financially. In an unusual move for the time, Hetty negotiated a prenuptial contract that kept the couple's finances strictly separated, to which Egret agreed without hesitation. And Hetty divorced him when the bank used her money as if it was his. Later on, Edward actually filed for bankruptcy, and Edward's worldly assets consisted of only $40 and a gold watch. Honestly, she called it when she knew something was up with that prenup. All her life, Hetty had been careful with money, starting with a modest inheritance and a few tips from her grandfather that he left. Despite her wealth, she was actually very, very cheap, which to be honest, is actually a good habit no matter what financial status you are. Being frugal can be a good thing, but for Hetty, she might have taken it too far. 
When her son Ned broke his leg as a child, she actually tried to set the leg herself because she didn't want to pay for a doctor. When that didn't work, she disguised herself and her son as paupers and tried to get into the clinic for free. They figured out that they weren't poor and they kicked them out. Apparently, she did finally consent to pay for medical care when Ned's leg got infected and had to be amputated. Because of this frugalness, even to sacrifice the well-being of her own children, despite being a billionaire, she is still considered a pretty disturbing person in history. Number one, Henry Cyril Paget. I feel like even though to me he wasn't necessarily disturbing. If I didn't put him at number one, he might have been a little annoyed. Born as the fifth Marquis of Anglesey, Lord Paget, and Earl of Uxbridge, he was also known as the Dancing Marquis. Henry Cyril Paget was always considered the black sheep of the family for his fabulous fashion sense, no restrictions of transparent silks, and because of this, his poor financial spendings that left him £700,000 in debt, which today, in this world, compared to the 19th century, was over £60 million. And if you're an American, that's $74 million. Canadians, that's $93 million. In summation, my dear Henry was broke. But he wanted to live as fast as he was fabulous, from buying expensive jewelry and furs, throwing extravagant parties, flamboyant theatrical performances. He would even transform a chapel at his family's castle into a 150-seated theater. He would act and dance sensually in the theater and have a free expression of clothing regardless of his gender and got into drag. There had been a lot of speculations on his preferred orientation when it came to love, but he did have a wife, but then after six weeks, she kind of left Henry. There was no evidence for or against him having any other lovers of either gender, and because it was never really identified of any specific gender, he had been marked as an LGBTQIA hero. Despite his attitudes and his lifestyle being so vividly out of the norm for the early 1900s, it's why his own family tried to erase any record of him after he died. But you can't stop the sun from shining no matter how many clouds there are in the sky. Number 10 Family Feud After making countless lists about kings and queens and learning about the lengths they go to to gain power, it shouldn't come as a surprise to learn that Emperor Nero did some pretty messed up stuff to secure his position of power. Though he would later become an absolute menace to Rome society, he might have picked up this whole violent seizure of power idea from his very own mother, since she pulled a stunt just to get Nero's foot in the door, so to speak. You see, Nero was never supposed to become emperor, but when Emperor Claudius married his niece, Agrippina, Nero's mother, she convinced Claudius to adopt Nero as his very own son. Which he did. Mysteriously, Claudius died shortly after all this went down, which meant that Nero was now in line to inherit the throne. Nero became emperor at 17, and in an effort to secure his place of power, he got the bright idea to eliminate anyone who might try and come for his seat of power. And so he poisoned his stepbrother and later had his mother eliminated as well because he saw how she took out Claudius and he didn't want to meet the same fate. I guess you could say that this was the beginning of the end for the people of Rome and for Nero himself. Number 9, a whole lot of money. This guy was like king, the sudden king of France, or I guess the OG because that came way later. But anyways, in the early morning of June 18th and 64 CE, a huge fire broke out and this blaze burned for 9 days, destroying 14 of Rome's districts and severely damaging 7 others. A large portion of Rome was leveled from the fire. Many citizens lost everything, but rumors started to break out that perhaps Nero was the one who started the fire in the first place. Why? Well, this rumor started after the emperor decided to build an opulent palace for himself that took up a hundred acres. Rather than use the Roman treasury to rebuild the city, he spent it on building his dream palace that he named Domus Aurea or the Golden House. This palace was so expensive to build that Nero was forced to devalue the Roman currency in order to stretch his money. This didn't really mean much to him, but for the rest of the people, this was devastating to the economy. So to explain their misfortunes that arose after the fire, they blamed the emperor, claiming that he was the one who started the blaze, therefore rumors. Historians are still uncertain if that's true or not, since at the time of the fire, Nero wasn't even in Rome, but he could have hired someone to carry out the plan. So who knows? Though we may never truly know, but honestly, I wouldn't put it past him. Before we continue talking about the things that made Emperor Nero a mess up dude, let me first take a moment to ask you guys to consider leaving a like on this video if you're enjoying it so far, and consider subscribing to the channel to stay a part of the hive, because we'll love that. Number 8, the shaving festival. This is like totally Sweeney Todd in my head. Anyways. In many cultures, there are coming of age celebrations. There's the quinceanera, the bar mitzvah, the bat mitzvah, and plenty of others around the world. Back during the rule of Emperor Nero, he came up with his very own version of a coming of age type of celebration, and it was thrown in honor of his beard. Yes, Nero created an entire festival to honor his facial hair. This takes me right back to grade A when all the boys were like, do you see it? 
Do you see it? Or like putting mascara on their mustaches? True story. In 59 CE, when Nero was 22 years old, he finally started getting enough facial hair to warrant being shaved. To honor this big event in his life, he invented Juvenalia, or the Games of Youth. This large festival was commissioned all because this guy was going to shave. Now, I'm not someone who grows facial hair like that, so I don't know if shaving your face for the first time is actually a big deal or not. Is it, Chris? Yeah. Is shaving your face for the first time a big deal? It can be. All right, there we go. But anyways, this Juvenilia Festival became a showcase for the performing arts. Every kind of theatrical performance was present at this festival, and Nero was known to have participated in some performances, but we'll get to that in a minute. Let's jump to the next point. Number seven, public performances. Let's talk about Emperor Nero, the actor. Nero always had a love for the arts. Many historians believe that if he never became emperor, then he would have become a performer. And some even think his dead dream of becoming a performer is what may have fueled his tyranny in the first place. He wanted his Oscar moment so bad, more than Leonardo DiCaprio, more than anything. And when Agrippina passed away, he found his chance. Nero wanted his popularity to rise, so he began to put on performances of songs he'd written in public. <laughs> Cringe. His active pursuit of the arts did the exact opposite, however. Roman nobles absolutely despised professional actors and actresses, so to see their leader do such a thing was an embarrassment. He even arranged his diet and activities around his artistic endeavors. Despite some of the more gritty details of this cruel emperor, his passion for the arts by all accounts was genuine. It was just super, super desperate, dude. Like, calm down. Number six, personal hype men. I hope you enjoyed that Zoe 101 reference, and yes, it is somehow related to Emperor Nero. Did I think I would ever use Zoe 101 and Emperor Nero in the same sentence ever in my life? No. No, I didn't. Goes to show we can't plan life, it just happens. But Nero wanted to make sure that no matter where he went or what happened, that he would always feel like he'd accomplished something awesome. So he hired his own little cheerleading squad of personal clappers. Well, not quite, there's some details missing. When Nero visited Alexandria, he was very impressed with the fashion in which the Egyptians clapped. So he summoned men from Alexandria and made sure more than 5,000 men learned the Alexandrian styles of applause. Then he made them do so vigorously when he sang. You're my wonder wall, clap for me. The men had noticeable thick hair and no rings on their hands so they wouldn't get you know beat up so they could keep clapping. Number five, Antichrist. Was Nero the Antichrist? Well, a lot of people like to think so. Put someone really evil on Earth and that question always seems to appear somewhere. After Nero took his own life in 68 AD, spoiler alert, many people believed that it was a cover up and that he was still alive. Some men even came forward claiming to be Nero himself. Some of these men even stepped forward and sang in public like he used to do. Each of these men were punished, but rumors of his demonic survival continued. Prophets foretold his return, though that may have been more of a metaphor than in a literal sense. Nero was one of the most monstrous people of the time, so it's not surprising to think he is evil. From biblical forces to his crucifixion of Christians, which we'll get to later, the personification of the Antichrist was said to arise in the form of an emperor, which made Nero really match up quite well with that whole thing, so who knows. Number four, messed up love. So of course, Nero had his fair share of mistresses, but according to rumor, there was none closer than mummy dearest. That's right, we got some Oedipus Rex action right now, but that was most likely a rumor perpetuated against a hated tyrant. But still, who can be sure? He and his mother often rode together in a litter and emerged with suspicious stains on their clothes, alleging what they might have done inside the litter. He also took up a mistress who looked a lot like his mother, which added fuel to the fire. Freud would have had a field day. But whatever love was between them would expire in 59 when Nero plotted to have his mother killed. His string of marriages were just as horrendous. His first wife, Octavia, he drove to take her own life. The second, he kicked to death while she was carrying. The third was his former mistress, whose husband he forced to take his own life so she would be free to marry him. Then there was Pythagoras, who was Nero's fave ex-slave. In 64 AD, they kind of married and Nero dressed as the bride. Nero also married another man named Sporus, who he also took away his manhood, should I say, so that he could be more of a woman in 67 AD. He took after his uncle Caligula when it came to taking advantage of the wives of his senators, which brings us to number three, animal games. I know, you know where I'm going with this. If you know where this is going, trigger warning folks, this man was warped if you hadn't figured that out. As I was saying, he was a really big fan of putting his senators into uncomfortable positions, 
putting them through massive ridiculous orgies, but he also devised an utterly horrendous and bizarre sex game where he would dress up as an animal covered in animal pelts, come out of a cage and attack men and women tied to stakes. But then when he got his like, you know, fill, he would go to one of his husbands to finish the job. In a way, he kind of sounds like an OG furry if furries were violent, but at the same time, Nero took his fetish way farther than anyone was comfortable with. Consent is sexy unless you're an emperor apparently who literally takes lives if he doesn't get his way. He also allegedly had booths set up along the river he traveled filled with mechanisms for pleasure and concubines role playing innkeepers for his pleasure. That could be a rumor but honestly I wouldn't put it past him. Number 2 Night Lights just when you think things have gotten as worse as they could get, it gets worse. But of course, this is Nero we are talking about, not Robert De Niro. He's a nice guy. They didn't have electricity back then, obviously, right? So at night they had to have a way of lighting up the night. Now, most logical people would be like, yeah, let's light a few torches, use some fire. But Nero had a darker idea that conveniently humiliated and tormented the people he hated the most, the Christians. When Rome burned, Nero went on to shift the blame to the Christians. Thousands of the followers were rounded up and punished in incredibly cruel ways. But most notably, he built pyres, covered them with tar, and used them as torches for an imperial festival. Amongst the burning bodies, he had naked dancers come Come out and frolic around the poor victims. Going back to the Antichrist thing we mentioned earlier, I think this really makes like for an open and shut case. And last one, time to go. Okay, let's do a quick recap here. Bestiality, matricide, unalived his first wife and his second along with his kid. He basically bankrupted Rome by building his golden palace, raised taxes to pay for it, uh, violated consent in so many brutal ways. Nero to zero. Am I right folks? The emperor's Rome began to crumble and his officials were not happy. He would soon be declared public enemy number one. Not long after a Roman governor renounced Nero and his legion was defeated in Germany, it was only a matter of time for the tyrant. The praetorian guard charged with guarding the emperor himself renounced him and he was officially declared an enemy of the people by the senate on June 8th in 64. Nero knew he was done for, so rather than face the masses and account for his crimes, Nero took his own life to beat them to it. His last words were apparently what an artist dies in me and he died with his current mistress at his side she ensured he at least had a very decent burial but that was that for the tyrannical ruler number 10 chop chop it's pretty difficult to talk about the Tudors without a little controversy. When you talk about King Henry VIII, for example, it's hard not to talk about him getting divorced and how he chose to go about it. And if you didn't know, it was beheading, a lovely royal European tradition. Basically, when old Henry wasn't getting his way or was in heat for someone else's whap, he wanted a divorce and sometimes the church just wouldn't grant him the separation he was looking for. So instead, he separated his wife's head from her body after accusing poor Anne Boleyn of adultery. Poor Anne Boleyn. Number 9. Father Neptune This might come as a surprise, but Great Britain didn't always have the strongest navy on earth. Henry VIII is considered to be the father of the Royal Navy. He commissioned the construction of many ships, largely increasing the size of the navy. He did his best to find the best shipbuilders and use tax money to fund the project. He also began to set up naval infrastructure and culture, with schools of navigation being opened and set away lands for docks to improve the effectiveness of the navy. And this was a great start, because when you fast forward a few hundred years, Great Britain had the strongest navy in the world, and that is what helped them conquer so many lands. Number 8. Fitzroy and sister. Royal families have weird bloodlines. I'm sure you guys know that by now, but I mean, come on, it's a little crazy. Looking at a royal family tree is like trying to decipher some of my high school essays. You gotta look at it for a while before you know what's going on. Sorry, Mrs. M. We all know that sometimes royals like to do weird things in their love lives, like marrying your sister or your brother to keep the bloodline pure and royal. But forcing your kids to marry because you need a male heir pronto is messed up. Yeah, at one point Henry VIII in his portly glory wanted an heir so bad he was going to make one of his many kids from his many mistresses marry one another. Thank God his son Fitzroy rushed into another marriage, most likely to avoid marrying his half sister. Why cross the street when you can cross the hall is probably something Henry thought. And you know what? I sent a telegram to the chief last night, it got back to me. Told me it wasn't it. Number 7. The Royal Crane. I relate to this one. Being a big boy is hard sometimes. People might want to pick on you in the schoolyard. 
You get excited at the sight of food, and the worst noise known to humankind is The fitness gram pacer test is a multi-stage aerobic capacity test that progressively gets more difficult as it continues. Oh yeah, you guys know what I'm talking about. But besides being an overweight teen in high school, King Henry VIII had his own issues. While not being a beefy boy in his youth, once he had become the tyrannical king he's remembered for, well, he wasn't doing P90X. Being the faux chonker that he was, poor King Henry could no longer mount his noble steed without assistance. That assistance would come in the form of a crane, would hoist the old boy up and into his saddle. Number 6. You up? I know I'm mad dissing King Henry here, and I know there's other tutors, but this guy's just really messed up. Here's something for our younger audience. We've all been there. So, the King of England had a few wives. Dude must have been slick with the ladies, right? Wrong. Honestly, dude's super cringe. I believe the term used for a man like this would be a waste you. I bring this up because the love letters he wrote to his mistresses are on the same equivalent as the you up text. Which the ladies of my generation will tell you is the most romantic thing a guy could say, especially on a school night at 3am. In one of the love letters to his dearly decapitated Anne Boleyn, he protests the urge to kiss her duckies. Which you can probably tell what part of her body that is. It's this part. Number 5. Bloody Mary. Her name isn't Sweet Mary, is it? Yeah, that's right. Bloody Mary, Bloody Mary, Bloody Mary. Oh, we're good. Okay, just check it. Most known for attempts at reversing the English Reformation, tried her very best to restore the papal order, and had over 300 people burned at the stake for being so-called heretics. Which, if you ask me, sounds like the worst possible way to die. Mary was overshadowed by her sister, which now coming to think of it, could be the reason why she was so pale. I'm just kidding. But being stuck in someone's shadow sucks. Kinda makes me mad, actually. All of a sudden, I wanna burn someone alive. Anybody got a match? Number four. Hey Alexa, can you translate this for me? Being a tutor is a big deal, right? And being on the royal throne of England is also a big deal, right? So obviously our majesty can read and write in English, right? Well, no, actually, he cannot. A more forgettable member of the Tudors is Philip II of Spain. He was the husband of Mary I and was officially recognized as the King of England. To not do so would be considered to be treason. The man also had his face on some coins, and if that's not official, I don't know what is. Someone put me on a coin. However, the biggest irony and the most messed up thing, if you really think about it, is that Philip did not speak or read a word of English. Oftentimes, when he was tending to matters of state, documents had to be printed in either Latin or Spanish in order for him to understand or even act on them. Honestly, if he can get away with that, then I'm proclaiming right now, I'm the king of Iceland. I don't speak Icelandic, but I'm the king. What's up, guys? How you doing? I'm the king now. Number three, Rebellion Crusher. Henry VII, turns out, wasn't such a great guy either. Having taken the throne after Richard III fell in battle, not everyone was so cool with him taking the reins, as he had a lot of rebellion crushing to do. People were upset. Suppress the rebellion. Can't trust your own court? Suppress them too. As it turns out, he was kind of a mama's boy, and his mother would often influence his political doings. But the worst thing he did was lock up a cousin of his enemies, who was only 10 years old at the time. He stayed in this tower, locked up, until his manual on aliving day at 24. It's just, it's just a nice family. Gosh. Number two, lethal R&D. Sometimes when you're at the top of your game, people want to take you down. A common assassination method in ye olde times was poison. So to prevent that from happening, King Henry and many kings before him had someone testing food for him. But unlike other kings, King Henry was not just testing his food, but his bed. Yeah, kings were worried that simply touching some poison was enough to send you to the kingdom in the sky. So the poor sap who made the king's bed in the morning had to pucker up and kiss his bed, just to make sure that no one had put anything fishy in his bed. The cushion on his chamber pot was also checked before a royal bowel movement. That is so disgusting, I, okay. Kiss my toilet, peasant. Check for poisons. Mm, so did you have pheasant last night? You know what I mean? Number one, face off. After Queen Elizabeth's face was scarred from smallpox, she wanted the Maybelline look again. Too bad that modern makeup companies didn't exist, because the alternative was just straight messed up. Her makeup was a lovely smelling concoction of vinegar and lead. I'll say that again, vinegar and lead. I don't even know how a human would come to even combine those two together. Lead being lead is toxic, and after being constantly applied to the face like that, well, she didn't live as long as Betty White did. Rest in peace, Betty White. Also, vinegar. Bathing was an issue back in the day, and having vinegar put on your face every day, well, that just must have made her pillow smell like roses. I feel bad for the guy who has to kiss her bed. Ooh. 
Number 10, the Papin sisters. A lot of families on this list are mainly siblings, but hey, blood is thicker than water, and for the Papin sisters, so is scandalizing an entire nation and touted as the crime of the century. Christine and Leah Papin were accused in 1933 of gruesomely and morally wounding their employers in what seemed to be a crazed act of raving madness. The sisters were first separated to work as maids in different households, but when they were united, they ended up working for the Lancelin household, a very bougie family in Le Mans. Of course, this was when everything went downhill, as one one night, the Lasselin women arrived late from a shopping spree and upon learning that the power had gone out, Madame Lasselin flew into a rage and in defense, Christine grabbed a putrid jug and hit her mistress over the head. After which, Genevieve, the daughter, came running after the elder Papin sister and the scuffle soon turned into a free-for-all. Both sisters then proceeded to tear the Lasselin women's eyes out and hit them repeatedly with a sharp object and beat their face in into a pulp with a hammer. Their case was extremely odd since the motive was still unclear and the girls were caught up in either a grips of insanity or just intentionally try to put revenge on their employers, who knows. Number 9, Raya and Sakina. Egyptian's most famous serial killers, these sisters began killing women in Alexandria at the turn of the 20th century for a multitude of reasons that remained rather vague if not properly understood. Prime motives point primarily to poverty, class-based anger and paranoia, and perhaps sex was uh, turmoil. Uh, for years, by increasing reports of missing women in Alexandria, all tied by two defining characteristics, their gender and apparently their wealth, that they were reported to be wearing gold jewelry and carrying large sums of money. They were also almost always seen with a woman named Sakina, who, despite facing interrogation multiple times, skillfully dodged any suspicions of her involvement. In 1920, when a passerby found a dismembered body, another man also happened to find human remains under his floor tiles while trying to fix a water pipe. Law enforcement put two and two together and realized that Raya and Sakina were renting a home in which they lured wealthy women and eventually ending their lives hiding their remains underground. The sisters were the first women to be given the death penalty in the new formerly Egyptian courts of the time, independent from a colonial rule. Number 8, the Genovese family. I mean, when it comes to crime and families, you're bound to discover, well, crime families. I am a fan of crime movies like Goodfellas, and honestly, they had really great actors in that film, and although they are compromised of the five top big families, I will start with the Genovese family. The families emerged at the end of the Castellamaris War, a family, a mafia power struggle in the early 1930s that was named after the Sicilian hometown of many of the participants. It left as many as 60 mobsters, many high-ranking dead, plus other organized crime factions throughout the country. Salvatore was also known as Luciano, who was active in profitable extortions, organizing adult work, gambling, and bootlegging schemes. And when he went to prison, Genovese took over as acting boss of what was then the largest and arguably most important and powerful of the five families. Families. During the years 1930s and 1960s, there was a constant battle between the members on takeover of control of the businesses and the developments made. The Genovese family is still active in the 21st century, reportedly engaging in such white collar crimes as extortions, loan sharking, and gambling. A 2006 raid led to the conviction of as many as 30 members of the family on racketeering charges, and six alleged associates were arrested in 2022. If I messed up your family's name, I'm sorry. <laughs> Number 7, the Messina Brothers. Speaking of crime families, the Messina Brothers were five brothers who led a criminal organization in London from 1930s to the 1950s. The crime was illegal adult work and of course trafficking. They operated in the UK where they took up English names and bought multiple properties throughout the West End. Their father apparently did the same trade of adult work organization and ran brothels and illegal houses. So they followed suit with their father and expanded over the UK. With a steady and highly profitable adult work operation and adequate protections from members of the Mo Metropolitan Police, the Messinas ran unchecked in the city. By the late 1940s, they were operating 30 houses and the women would hand 80% of their earnings to the brothers and by 1950s, the police estimated that at least 200 of London's most expensive adult workers were Messina girls. Prosecutions proved difficult as many of the women who worked for them had valid passports, making it harder for them to make a case of either the women or the brothers. Later, they started recruiting local English girls by the age old technique of giving good looking girls as a good time and possibly promising of marriage, followed by being induced into, well, adult work. They eventually were caught by the the end of the late 1950s where they all been forced to flee the country, each brother was charged and only four of the brothers dealt with the authorities as some were acquitted and others imprisoned, like Eugenio who received a six year sentence, did lay a foundation for other crime associations and organizations to follow suit as they continue to find loopholes. Number 6, Inessa Tarverdi Eva and family. Closer to the present day, we have Inessa and her husband Roman and their two daughters Victoria and Anastasia. Inessa was, was older than her husband and Victoria was her daughter from a previous relationship, Anastasia was just 13 years old. For 
this middle class family, money was not the motive for the serials, for the series of killings and robberies that began in 2007. The family took regular camping trips that was a cover for their crimes. They would break into houses, kill any occupants before taking whatever they could find. Often the stuff that they found or took of little value were probably just trophies. Some of the attacks were so gruesome. In one raid, there were only two teenage girls in the house. The family tortured them, gouged their eyes out, and finally got rid of them. Because of the relationship with a policeman that had not ended well, Inessa particularly enjoyed killing cops. The authorities finally arrested them in 2013, and we still don't know how many people fell victim to this family. Number five, Shaka. Gradually expanding his power until he ruled with absolute authority, he had a grasp of tactics that made the Zulu warriors feared by all. He insisted on absolute obedience and would ruthlessly punish anyone who didn't live up to his expectations. Defeated warriors might return to camp to find that Shaka had had their families executed, they would also probably suffer the same fate. People still debate whether or not he was a cruel tyrant or a true father of a proud nation. Regardless, it was his own family who turned on him. After Shaka's mother died, he began to behave erratically. He ordered mourning rituals that made great demands on his people and resulted in hardships for many. He was unfortunately assassinated by his half-brothers in 1828. Most Zulu people today revere him as he was a hard taskmaster, but he gave his people pride in themselves. Number four, the Mulhall sisters. Linda and Charlotte Mulhall, 30 and 23 respectfully, were the subjects of one of the most intense criminal cases in Ireland's history. One night after being fed up, the women killed and dismembered their mother's boyfriend, Farah Swali Lutnur, who physically, allegedly physically harmed their mother, and the events leading up to the incident propelled it to the front page as newspapers went into extreme details of the sisters' troubled histories, which include adult work, crime, and illegal substance abuse. Uh, on the night of the event, the sister t allegedly took ecstasy pills with her mother and the victim. Nor was killed with a sharp object wielded by Charlotte and was struck by a hammer by Linda following a confrontation with the sisters and their mother, Kathleen Mulhall. The subsequent manhunt and the trial in October 2006 attracted intense media attention as the details of the crime slowly emerged. The police were also notified when parts of the victim's leg with a sock still on it was spotted floating down a river 10 days later. The sister and their mother were arrested but released until Linda confessed to the involvement in the crime. The case received a high amount of attention due to the grotesque and, and macabre nature of this crime. This led to the sisters being dubbed as the Scissor Sisters by the media. Number three, the Sivalaski twins. Called the killer twins, this duo basically grew up committing crimes together. It started when they were young and would challenge each other to steal bigger and bigger things until they got older and the dares got more extreme. So extreme to the point where one of the brothers killed a store owner in 1971 while his brother was serving time in jail, Robert's life fell apart. He became addicted to illegal substances and eventually began committing crime himself. And now considered a serial killer, Robert killed four people including his girlfriend who was strong with an electrical cord. The brothers were estranged for most of their lives, and when a police officer showed Stephen an article about his brother con confessing to four murders, he said, I thought I was the only criminal in the family. Number two, the Menendez brothers. If you were raised in the 90s, you might remember a bit of the Menendez brothers, two young men from Beverly Hills, California, who killed their parents on August 20th, 1989, then went on a six month spending spree with their parents' money. The case was so shocking to the media, including how after the deaths occurred, the brothers went to watch James Bond's License to Kill and tried to use it as an alibi. How a week prior, their mother confided to her therapist that she was worried that her sons might be sociopaths and how one brother bought an entire chicken wing restaurant with his parents' money after they had died. Their father was an executive in the entertainment industry and both went to private school and the older brother, Lyle, was briefly enrolled in Princeton. After two deadlocked juries, LA prosecutors retried the brothers in a courtroom that did not allow cameras and their new jury found them guilty on two counts of first degree. They were sentenced by the judge to life in prison. And number one is the Manson family. I think it counts to mention this family even though some aren't necessarily blood related, they still committed a lot of crime together. Coming at number one is the Manson family, as the Manson family is known amongst its members as The Family, was a commune gang and cult led by criminal Charles Manson that was active in California in the late 1960s and early 1970s. The group consistent, consisted of approximately 100 followers who lived an unconventional lifestyle, frequently psychoactives including hallucinogens such as LSD. Most were young women from middle class backgrounds, many of, many of whom were attracted by the hippie culture and communal living and then radicalized by Manson's teachings. According to the the group member as Susan Atkins, the members of the family became convinced that Manson was a manifestation of Jesus Christ and believed in his prophecies concerning an imminent apocalyptic race war. In 1969, family members Susan Atkins, Tex Watson, and Patricia Krenwinkel entered the home of Hollywood actress Sharon Tate and ended her life as well as four others. Linda Casabian was also present, but she did not take part. Members of the Manson families are also committed a number of other dangerous crimes and assaults, petty crime and thief and street vandalism. Number 10, Genghis Khan's clan. We know Genghis Khan and his conquest to take over China was no small feat. 
as it needed the help of his entire clan to help with his takeover. Coming from a small section in Mongolia, they formed together what had been the largest land empire in history. The Mongols always viewed family as the central pillar of society, and Genghis' sons and grandsons extended the empire from the western shores to the Black Sea to the Pacific. And although they seem outnumbered, their military tactics and psychological warfare were noted in constant success against their enemies. If the city and people they plundered surrendered, the Mongols would then treat them fairly and allow them to join in their bounty, but if the people resisted, they would feel the fury of the Khan clan. Despite the brutal acts of destruction, the Khan clan, whomever they inevitably conquered, the lands were actually safe and well controlled, and in many cases even improved from previous conditions. Subjects had personal liberty and had the rights to follow whatever religion they believed in without prejudice. Number 9. The Briley Brothers One of our sibling duos who had no problem committing crimes together starts with the Briley Brothers. In 1971, 16-year-old Linwood Briley shot and killed his 57-year-old neighbor, landing him in reform school. This violent episode was a taste of what was to come. From March to October 1979, Linwood and his brother James and Anthony embarked on a bloody hit spree in Richmond, Virginia, with accomplices Dunk. With accomplices Duncan Meckins, they robbed and killed at least 11 people. Two would-be victims would escape unharmed and they were able to report to authorities of the terrible crimes they saw commit. The brothers continued to leave a trail of terror throughout Richmond and after they were caught, Linwood and James were sentenced to death. In 1984, the two elder brothers escaped death row with four other inmates but were recaptured within three weeks. Linwood and James were executed by electric chair in 1984 and 1985 respectfully, and Anthony Brilly and Duncan Meekins are both still incarcerated. Number 8. Cray Twins In some parts of the world, having twins was considered a rare commodity, and in 1933, during a time where having children, let alone twins, was a prized rarity. Their mother, Violet Ann Lee Cray, was particularly given a slight celebrity status when her twin boys not only survived in their infancy, but also were able to survive in towards adulthood. Their mother, Violet Annie Lee Cray, was particularly given a slight celebrity status when her twin boys not only survived in infancy, but also were able to both be able to survive towards adulthood. Some might even speculate their mother planted seeds of malignant narcissism the twins would later display as adults. Born Ronnie and Reggie Cray were noted as one of the most dangerous twins in London. The twins formed an organized crime gang called The Firm, and these, ga and these gangsters were particularly active in London, England in the 60s. They were so dangerous due to their massive extortion rackets, armed robbery, arson protection rackets, gambling, and cold-blooded killings of rival gang members. That's when they were arrested on May 8, 1968. Ronnie ended up being filed as a certified insane person and was committed to a hospital. As for his brother Reggie was released from prison on compassionate grounds, both died five years apart from the other. Number 7. The Gonzalez Sisters The four Gonzalez sisters ran a successful business from 1945 until the police closed it down in 1964. So what was the business? Adult work. Rancho El Angelo was a brothel in the Mexican state of Guanajuato and, and acted as the center of the sisters' large-scale adult work network. The women who worked for the sisters often did not so voluntarily. The Gonzalez sisters, well the Gonzalez family, had kidnapped some while others answered advertisements for housemaids. When the women arrived to the brothel, the sister would often force and inject illegal substances on those who, would re who were reluctant to provide the services that the sisters demanded. When the girls became unable to or reluctant to work and satisfy their clients, the sisters then killed them. If a client turned up with a lot of money, he too might end up dead and his cash stolen. When police raided the property, they founded the bodies of 80 women, 11 men, and various fetuses. Ugh. There were probably many more victims who remained undiscovered, and the Mexican court sentenced the sisters to 40 years in prison. Guinness World Records even named them the most prolific murder partnership ever. Number 6. The Harp Brothers Here's another pair of siblings for you, the Harp Brothers. Mecca Jai and Willie terrorized settlers in the remote, sparsely populated territory west of the Appalachian Mountains immediately after the American Revolution. The brothers had stayed loyal to the British Crown during the struggle and may have decided that they had better moved west after the American victory. They survived by robbing and killing the settlers who were beginning to cultivate the area and appeared to have thoroughly enjoyed the killing part. It wasn't long of course before the vigilantes started to bring the brothers to justice as Mekajai died of his wounds and when a posse caught up with them in 1799, Willie escaped but the authorities captured and had him sent to the gallows in 1804. They were considered America's first serial killers of this time. Number 5. The Bloody Benders Running an Airbnb seems like a lot of work, especially when you're trying to make sure your guests and yourself are happy with the accommodations. You got your nice bed and breakfast, and oh of course a nice dinner where the host comes up from behind you and smashes you in the head with a sledgehammer. Oh wait, no, that's not a good idea, actually. Uh, yeah. In 1870s, travelers headed west on the Great Osage Trail may find themselves in a cabin made by the Bender family in Labette County, Kansas. And eventually, they would find themselves dead and gone by the family's unexplainable reasons to commit crimes. To be honest, officials still don't know why the crimes were done the way they did. They actually suspected robbery, but most of these travelers weren't even wealthy. 
Maybe in some sadistic manner, the families just felt like it. But either way, before the locals got suspicious, this family disappeared around the same time another family called the Kellys surprisingly were new in town. Number four, the Borgias. Originally from Spain, this family became so important in the 15th century political and religious world. Ambition and hunger for yet more power, the family included two popes. Lucrezia is probably the best remembered member of the family as she was the daughter of Pope Alexander, and her family was perfectly happy to use her as a pawn in their power plays. She entered into several arranged marriages, each one helping the Borgias extend their grip. Kind of like in the movie Get Out by Jordan Peele where they use Rose to get their new vessels for whatever it was that they were doing. Hmm. Contemporaries often portrayed the extended family as ruthless, a family that would stop at nothing in pursuit of its own ends, and by the time the Alexander Papacy ended, people suspected them of adultery, theft, bribery, and breeding, and morally injuring people. Whether or not these situations were true, historians do suspect it might have been conspiracies made by jealous rivals. Number three, the Bean Clan. Spoiler alert, if you watch Attack on Titan, you might know the scene where Hanji had two titans in her custody named Swanee and Bean. Well, those names were actually based on a real family, the Bean family, and their head, Swanee. Although his name is actually Alexander Bean, him and his wife in the 16th century set up a nice little home and abode in a cave by the countryside of Scotland. In their little sea cavern, they produced up to 45 children who were also some a produce of inbreeding. And by that point, they figured they couldn't just hunt for omega 3s by the seas, they needed to resort by some other ways to provide excellent nutrients. So they began tricking, trapping, and kidnapping travelers and dipping them into homemade ranch dressing. That's right, they ate people, and they survived by eating people. The clan only operated at night, and when they returned home to their little caves is where they could eat the roasted man or woman. The locals didn't know this was a thing, and for 25 years, the clan survived and ate up to a thousand people. The family was tracked down by authorities and all died under their custody. The tale of the Bean clan only appeared in a Newgate calendar in the 18th century, and its publications always highlighted awful crimes to educate its readers. However, this was the same type of publication that had the same notoriety as a fake news forum. Number two, Fred and Rose West. Ever see someone at the bus stop and thought they were really cute, but also thought, hey, you know what? They'd be a great accomplice for a lot of crime. And that's what happened to Fred and Rose West. The two serial killers met at a bus stop and somehow created a relationship with one another. From 1971 to 1987, the couple would sought out female victims in Gloucestershire, England, and after tormenting and eventually slaying the victims, they would bury them in their cellar. Earning the name the House of Horrors among the many victims was actually Fred's daughter. By 1994, the law finally caught up with the couple and Rose was convicted to up to 10 of the crimes and sentences to life in prison. Meanwhile, her cohort, Fred, took his own life before he could be convicted. When he did die, he did confess to 30 of the victims he tormented, which unfortunately might be even speculating that there's probably more victims left undiscovered. Number one, Sackler family. The Sackler family is an American family who owned the pharmaceutical company and have faced lawsuits regarding overprescriptions of addictive pharmaceutical drugs, including Oxycontin. Purdue Pharma has been criticized for its role in the opioid epidemic in the United States, and they have been described as the most evil family in America and the worst drug dealers in history. They were often cited as early pioneers of medication techniques, which, which ended the common practice of lobotomies, and were also regarded as the first to fight for racial integration of blood banks. In 1996, Burdu Pharma introduced Oxycontin, a reformulated version of Oxycodone, in a slow release form. Oxycodone was first invented in 1916 and sold as Eucodal, but had been withdrawn from the market in 1990 due to addiction issues. Hmm. Despite them putting out their good deeds through donations by multiple Ivy League schools and art foundations, they're also noted for their money laundering and, of course, the opioid lawsuits. According to the New Yorker, Purdue Pharma played a special role in the opioid crisis because the company was the first to set out in the 1990s to persuade the American medical establishment that strong opioids should be much more widely prescribed and that physicians' long-standing fears about the addictive nature of such drugs were overblown. Yeah, okay. Purdue Pharma was dissolved on September 1st, 2021. The Sacklers agreed to pay $4.5 billion over nine years with most of that money funding addiction treatment, as they should. Kicking off the list at number 10, Election Day. Known as the most corrupt pope in the history of the Catholic Church, Rodrigo Borgia, even before he became the big talk of the town, he bribed his way to get there. Yeah, shocker. They were Spanish-speaking nobles who rose to their power all over the Italian peninsula during the Renaissance. And it certainly helped when Rodrigo's uncle, Alfonso de Borgia, became Pope Calixtus III come 1455. They say it's all about who you know, and that was the case for these relatives. 
He was the first ever pope in history to acknowledge his children, which, like many things on this list, was super controversial at the time. But it only gets better. Number 9. Lions, Tigers, Mistresses, and Children So as far as I learned in church, priests, especially the pope, weren't allowed to have children because there was this whole like chastity thing, I don't know. However, back in the Borgia's time, it was actually quite common for popes to have mistresses and father children. However, it wasn't acknowledged, and for the most part, it was hidden. Pope Alexander made the bold choice of not only acknowledging his children, but spoiling them. The same for his mistresses. Everyone knew! He fathered four children with a Roman noblewoman named Venosa Catane, Joffrey, Juan, and most famously, Cesare and Lucrezia Borgia. He did everything he could to advance their careers, marrying them off to rich relations, and even made Cesare head of the military. Their complicated careers didn't stray far from the limelight, adding even more to their illustrious careers of the Borgias. Number 8. Familiar Face the face of Jesus Christ has appeared in the most bizarre places. Most of the time, it's toast. I don't know why, it's always a toast. No idea why, but European depictions of Jesus Christ, believe it or not, are based off Cesare Borgia's face. Imagine somebody using your face for the Lord's. It's kind of cool. Also, is this okay? Are people mad? What happened here? That's how much power this guy had. When his father became Pope Alexander VI in 1471, Cesare, at just age 15, was made into a bishop, and then three years later, a cardinal. One of the biggest scandals still to this day is that Jesus' early appearance is based off the young Borgia. The claim comes from novelist Alexandra Dumas, who apparently heard it from biblical theorists. Apparently Jesus was depicted as a non-European because he was Jewish, but the Borgia Pope, our madman, decided to make a more European looking Jesus, so he used his illegitimate son Cesare as their new model. Number 7, Cesare and Disease. The apple didn't fall far from the tree, especially in the case of Cesare Borgia. Though he wasn't Alexander's favorite son, he was loved dearly ever still. Just like his father, Cesare was prone to indulgence and was quite the ladies' man, but unlucky for many people in Europe at the time, Syphilis was basically everywhere. It was a big deal. It was just a matter of time before the terrible disease caught up with him. Precisely who gave it to him is unknown, but historians believe they know when he got it. In the summer of 1497, at the ripe age of 22, he was sent by his father to Naples to broker a marriage for his sister Lucrezia. Naples was full of brothels and ripe with disease. At the time, it seemed no one could escape the disease, as was the result for Cesare. The disease would show up in sweeping cankers, Doors and the skin would be eaten away, sometimes to the bone. This was the case for Cesare, who eventually had to wear a mask to disguise the scars the disease had caused. Number 6. In the family. Like many traditional royal families, they like to keep everything tight, keep everything close together, a little too close some would say. Marriages were arranged, you had to marry your own family member, and on top of that, so many of these dudes in history just cheated and partied while the wives gave birth and tended to house duties. It was bullshit. For Italy's original crime family, they kept everything also a little too close. One of the bigger scandals surrounding them was Lucrezia and Cesare doing the dirty. Her first husband, Giovanni Forza, made these claims first. He actually said Lucrezia was getting it on with her brother and father. Yuck and yuck. Two yucks for the price of one yuck. She was named after the Roman noble woman Lucretia, so this rumor is a pretty ironic one, if true. Most of these rumors came from their enemies, of course, but many have noted that Cesare's intentions to take out Lucretia's husbands had to come from somewhere. This really does sound like Game of Thrones, eh? Wow. I'm on season four, no spoilers. Number five, the death of Juan Borgia. One of the darkest and most mysterious events of the Borgias is the cold case involving Juan Borgia. On June 14th, 1497, Juan Borgia was seen leaving a dinner party at his mother's home. After dinner, he sent his companions and his brothers off on a mysterious errand. He had a habit of wandering the streets of Rome in the evening and his brothers thought, you know, he was just like gonna meet some cool lady. But as I mentioned, he was Alexander's favorite son, so when a day passed, he got worried. On the 16th, a timber merchant came forward and said that on the night of the disappearance, he was waiting for a shipment on the Tiber River. He saw a man with a white horse approach with a body slung over the horse. The four men threw the body into the river and threw rocks at it until it sank. Pope Alexander VI immediately had the river searched and sure enough, they pulled Juan's body from the waves. He was fully clothed with his coin purse still fully attached, ruling out robbery and implying an assassin. Alexander was inconsolable, but the investigation stopped. 
suddenly, implying they discovered who it was and could do nothing about it. The two loudest suspects were his very own brothers, Cesare and Joffrey, each having their own jealousies which provided strong motive. Number 4. A Cold Death Cesare Borgia passed away March 12, 1507. He was in the woods near Vienna and he was actually on his way to suppress a rebellion against his own brother-in-law, King John. Now it was terrible weather that day so what happened was Cesare left town thinking his men were following him but in reality they actually bailed, they turned around. Yeah, thunderstorms on a horse, they're like, mm, no, pass, obviously. I don't even drive when it's raining, I'm like, mm, nope. Subsequently, he was surrounded by his enemy and was stabbed to death. But the thing is, those men were ordered to capture Cesare alive, but because of the storm and it was dark and the fact that he was all alone, they didn't realize that this was him. His armor was brought back to Cesare's squire and that's when reality sadly sunk in. Number 3, Lucrezia Borgia. Oh boy, where do we start with this one? The life of this woman reads like a damn 15th century opera. Dramatic, over the top, and tragic. Lucrezia's first marriage was a messy one, as she was very much used as a pawn. It was a political match between Giovanni Sforza, whom she married when she was just 13, and he was 26 and we know that didn't end well. Her father chose to annul the marriage when a more lucrative match appeared. He declared that he was impotent in an attempt to preserve his daughter's chastity, and the marriage was annulled. However, at the time, she was six months pregnant with someone's baby. Not Giovanni's though. This scandal Alexander covered up only to reveal the child three years later. Her second husband, Alfonso, she apparently loved dearly before he was mysteriously strangled to death in his sleep. But beyond her love life, Lucrezia was rumored to be an infamous poisoner. It was alleged that she wore a hollow ring that she would fill with poison and use at her leisure. She was even implicated in Juan's death. A lot of rumors, a lot of drama, the scandal seemed never ending with Lucrezia Borgia. Number two, too cool for school. We all know somebody who went to a private school later on in their life and then they started to change a little. You know, maybe they're doing more hair flips, they start saying words like whomst, you know, stuff like that. Well, when Rachel said the scandals with Lucrezia are never ending, she was onto something, of course. Young Lucrezia was given the best education. Now, today's standards, when you have a family this high up, that's not surprising. But back in those days, young girls were dependent on convents for their education. So nuns would teach them godly obedience, you know, that's the whole point. Lucrezia's education was deemed a degenerate one. Oh, you went to Harvard? Wow, what a degenerate. How could you? Hashtag the Lord. <laughs> Number one, man. What the heck? Banquet of chestnuts. Whatever euphemism popped into your head right now is probably not far off, so just like put it in the comments because I want to see what one's the best. Here at number one, we have the banquet of chestnuts. And no, I'm not talking about chestnuts roasting on an open fire unless you're into that. The banquet of chestnuts was the most famous Halloween party in the history of the world. Basically, what went down was a giant orgy. October 30th, 1501, a massive banquet was organized in the Papal Palace of all places, which included nobility and senior officials of the Catholic Church. But workers of the night and nude entertainment were invited as well, and for the rest of the night, vows of chastity were out the window. They basically played sexy party games. Even the Pope participated. Although it sounds too fantastic to be true, it was legitimized by a first-hand written account. It was hosted by Pope Alexander VI and his son, Cesare Borgia. Two peas in a pod. The banquet was decadent, full with food and delicacies of irresistible quality, along with 50 of Rome's finest lustful entertainers. This even gave insight to the duplicitous and flawed nature of religious authority of the time, preaching one manner of life to the masses and behaving the complete opposite behind closed doors. Number 10, Elizabeth I. Good old Queen Bess is one of the most remembered queens in the British monarchy, male or female. She's a pretty big deal. Elizabeth loved to make her fellow male nobles fall under her spell. She was witty, cunning, and very well liked by her court. However, one of the things that earned her some enemies was establishing a Protestant England. Her sister Mary, her predecessor, fought very hard for the opposite. She was very Catholic, and we will get to how bloody that was later, but Queen Bess a lot of people off, especially Spain. She was supposed to marry the Catholic Spanish king after her sister passed, but uh, she turned him down. This led to a conflict between Protestant England and Catholic Spain, but her navy defeated the Spanish Armada in 1588. Mary, Queen of Scots, laid claim to the English throne and was one of Lizzie's greatest internal threats. Mary was a Catholic, which made all the Catholics of England back her. Mary was also presumed to be behind several assassination attempts against the queen. Finally, 
finally Queen Elizabeth had to take action and after keeping her cousin hostage for 20 years, she finally had to have her executed. And we'll talk more about her later. Number 9, Catherine the Great. So Catherine the Great was called the Great for a reason. She was a pretty epic woman by most accounts. She even had one of the first vaccines, which is pretty crazy. Though she wasn't actually born in Russia or even Russian at all, Catherine was not content to go down in history quietly. She considered herself an enlightened ruler and history tends to agree with aims of prioritizing education for the people. She had many lovers and there is enough evidence to suggest that the son she had was illegitimate. Peter III of Russia was hardly the man Catherine intended on marrying, and later planned a coup against him which resulted in her position of power. However, the coup did turn bloody when on July 17th, Peter died under mysterious circumstances. There isn't proof that she was directly involved or even knew about it, but it cast a dark shadow over her reign for the rest of the time. Number 8, Grace O'Malley. We've got enough traditional royalty on this list that we definitely need to spice it up. Enter Grace O'Malley, the Pirate Queen of Ireland. Pirate Queen, what a title. Definitely considered unholy behavior, Grace abandoned the traditions of women of the time and fled to the sea. There she took on the waves and perils of Davy Jones Locker with a legendary ferocity. She was born into the clan O'Malley around 1530 around the time of Henry VIII's rule over England and Ireland. Clan O'Malley was a notorious seafaring clan and ruled the southern shore of Clue Bay, Aquiland, and most of the barony of Murrisk for over 300 years. Grace was really well educated and could even converse fully in Latin, Spanish, Scottish, Gaelic, and French. She was not one to be refused and after spending years fighting the British, she finally met Queen Bess and not only did she speak Latin to her, but she refused used to bow as she was considered a queen herself by that point. Number 7, Mary Queen of Scots. I told you I was going to bring her up. A name you will recognize as I've already mentioned her before, but in terms of who the villain in that story is, it depends on which side you're telling the story on. Mary's story is full of tragedy, romance, betrayal, loss, and heartbreak. Unlike Lizzie, Mary was a dedicated Catholic and spent the entirety of her reign trying to gather the Catholics against Elizabeth. She had a series of marriages and relationships that led to tragedy every which way she went. Her first husband, the Dauphin of France, died shortly after their marriage. Her second husband she loved until he became a drunkard and then she just started running things. But he was mysteriously unalive while she was six months pregnant. He was inside a building that exploded but his body landed outside and it turned out he was strangled. So what happened there? She would later give birth to two stillborn sons but she would have sons later on. She would have a son who would inherit the throne after Elizabeth's death but it was due to Mary's plotting and scheming that eventually ended her in death. So she did actually plot to kill Elizabeth. So that's a pretty unholy deed, I would say. Number six. Princess Olga of Kiev. Okay, wow, this woman. One saint you definitely don't want to mess with. Despite being a saint, Princess Olga of Kiev was actually pretty sinful. She was one of the most vicious and vengeful rulers in the history of Kievan Rus, which would later become Russia, Ukraine, and Belarus. Olga took center stage after her husband died and made sure she would never be forgotten. Her husband died in a very gruesome way by the enemies that we're going to talk about in a second. When the people who viciously unalived her husband tried to persuade her to marry their leader, they sent 20 men. Olga told them to wait in their boats, had her men dig a ditch in the meantime, and the next morning buried the men alive. She then lied and told the king she would accept his offer if he sent his best company to retrieve her. He didn't know about all that stuff yet. When they got there, she locked them in a bathhouse and torched it. But I didn't stop there. Olga didn't stop there. That's not her style. She would later host a steak dinner with her enemies in which they were staked. Very Vlad the Impaler, I know. Then she set whole villages on fire by attaching sulfur to pigeons and then it was just crazy. Damn, like hell has no fury like a woman scorned, let me tell you. Number five, Queen Isabella I. The Spanish Inquisition, pretty high up there as far as terrifying points in history go. If you weren't willing to convert to Catholicism, you were tormented, interrogated, and burned at the stake. Who was behind this awful time in history? This lady, Queen Isabella I. Technically, as she was fighting for a holy order for the Catholic Church, this can be seen as holy, but was it? Burning people at the stake because they didn't share this belief? Ah, not cool, Isabel. She created a secular government through her reign which allowed for the monarchy to have more power. Being a pious Catholic, she made Catholicism the official religion and created a tribunal to make this happen. Secret service or a secret police that spread fear wherever they went. Her direct influence caused the Jewish population to falter for a really long time after. Number four, Friedegun of Soissons. Okay, I maybe said that wrong, so I apologize. Kind of impressed with her rise to power. She went from slave attendant 
to queen. How do you bridge that gap? No idea. Boy was she ferocious. Assassination and manipulation were her main political tools. Fritigan was among a small number of enslaved women in the Merovingian household that became a queen. Merovingian was the OG Central Europe before everything got split up. She survived political dangers and retained her husband's loyalty and could persuade monks and priests to jump onto her plots with ease. She encouraged her husband, the king, to set aside his first wife and then even take the life of his second. But his second wife, Galswinda, had a sister named Brunhild who became the mortal enemy of Fredegund. She had good reason to be. Fredegund continued to do everything she could to secure her position, one assassination after the next. She was a pretty stormy lady. Number 3, Bathory. Okay, okay, okay. All right. Technically not a queen, I get it, but she might as well have been with the power that she had. So fight me. She's remembered as the most evil woman in the world in history, I think. I don't know. That's my opinion. Bathory was the stuff of nightmares. Elizabeth Bathory was born on August 7th, 1560 into a prominent Hungarian noble family, making her practically untouchable. She married a very famous war hero who is suspected of gifting Bloody Lizzie with the skills she used to kill. After she died, Bathory became obsessed with immortality. Supposedly when one of her servants accidentally spilt blood on her and her skin appeared younger after. Bathory then began her mission of horror, luring over 650 young virgin women to her palace and brutally taking their lives. She was even bold enough to lure daughters of nobility. Before draining them of their blood, she would make them suffer in ways you don't even want to imagine before bathing in the blood itself. When she was finally caught, three of her servants were executed but she was simply locked away in her tower for the rest of her days on house arrest. Ugh. Number 2, Catherine de Medici, also known as the Serpent Queen. History colors her story as the tale of the evil queen. On one hand, she is remembered for being one of the most powerful French queens in history, and then on the other, she was blamed for the many atrocities that took place during her reign. Her regency was marked by the French wars of religion and the many games Catherine played within them. The Catholics and the Protestants, as previously mentioned, were at war, and she spent a lot of time trying to find peace. Kind of. But she was a passionate Catholic and is believed to have tried to remove a Protestant general from her son's side. When he survived the attack, she lied and convinced her son that the Protestants were responsible so she scapegoated them. So he authorized taking the lives of their leaders. Enter St. Bartholomew's Massacre. Catherine implicated the general which resulted in him being the first to be beaten and then tossed out of his own bedroom window. An estimated 3,000 French Protestants were taken out in Paris, but the total countrywide was around 70,000. And last but not least, Bloody Mary, actually known as Queen Mary the First of England. So no, I'm not talking about the girl you say in the mirror three times so that she appears and you're like, wow, I'm haunted forever. Queen Mary became known as Bloody Mary due to her vicious tirade against Protestants in England during her reign. She even imprisoned her own sister, Elizabeth, who we mentioned at the beginning of this list, due to suspicions of treason. This was unfounded. She bore her father Henry VIII ill will after the stuff he pulled with the church and after having delegitimized her as his heir for a time. After Mary took the throne and married the Catholic King of Spain, she began carrying out her plan for England to become Catholic once again. In 1555, she revived England's heresy laws and began burning offenders at the stake, starting with her father's longtime advisor, Thomas Cramer, the Archbishop of Canterbury. She burned over 300 convicted heretics, most of them being common citizens, and dozens more died in prison, hence giving her the name of Bloody Mary. At number 10, the king of hobbies. Everyone has their interests, right? Like for example, I like video games and I like watching people scream at their teammates for not helping everyone else out. I'm looking at you, Blake. For kings back in the day, they didn't have people on Rocket League to scream at, so they had to find other interests. For Tsar Peter the Great, he had a lot of interests and they were all very bizarre. Firstly, he had an obsession with short people, especially dwarves. To him, they were like his real life dolls or something and he would hold weddings for them and even hold lavish funerals, complete with small horses pulling a small coffin on a carriage, and even a very short priest to hold the ceremony. But other than this obsession with short people, he also dabbled a bit in medicine. He liked watching surgeries be performed like he was trying to be on Grey's Anatomy or something, but when watching the surgeries just wasn't enough for him, he would sometimes perform them himself. Now remember, 
he's not a doctor. So it's no surprise to learn that these surgeries rarely ever went well and people died. I certainly wouldn't trust him to give me any kind of surgery, but he was a king so he could do whatever he wanted. Peter the Great also loved dentistry. It is said that if you wanted to get all buddy buddy with the king, all you had to do was let him pull your tooth. Sounds like the guy was one heartbreak away from starting his own medical drama, but in the worst way. Number 9. Banning coffee. This is the worst of the worst people. Murad the 4th, Sultan of the Ottoman Empire. The guy banned coffee like an absolute monster. No more triple triples for you. He was born in 1612 and for the most part his mother was ruling through him because he was so young. That's often the case with most of these young rulers. They just get Hey, you're seven, now you rule a kingdom, enjoy. It's, you know, it's tough, they're not gonna know what's going on. But when he got a little bit older, he put forth these laws, punishable by death, might I add, in order to get things back on track, that was the key. He banned coffee, tobacco, and alcohol. He would actually disguise himself as a civilian during the nighttime and would wander around aimlessly in hopes that he would find one of these dark roast renegades. If you were caught outside having a quick smoke break, you weren't arrested, you didn't get fined, but rather, Murad IV himself would take your head off right there in the streets. No trial, no jury, just straight to execution. All because you're drinking a Bud Light Lime. At number eight, why you mad? Now this could be a bit of a controversial opinion, but if your name includes the words the mad, I would assume that you're not doing too great, right? I mean, you have to earn that title, and if it's a title that harsh, that simply begs the question, what in the H-E double hockey sticks did you do to get that name? Well, for Charles the Mad, he did a lot. Charles became king when he was only 11 years old, so that certainly didn't help his development and knowing this kind of helps explain a lot of his actions. He was known for getting really angry and throwing fits of rage and was known to give people the gift of the big sleep, if you know what I mean. Charles didn't always kill people though, only sometimes. Other times he liked to switch things up. Sometimes he would run around his palace pretending to be a wolf. Other times he would go through phases where he just really didn't want to keep up with his personal hygiene and he would get so gross that he literally had to be cut out of his own clothes. Now, I don't know how long you have to go without bathing to get to that point, but really, I don't think I want to know the answer to that question. Charles also thought that he was made of glass, and so he would go through phases where he would sit completely still so that he didn't break. Kind of like Drax from Guardians of the Galaxy, but not as, you know, extraterrestrial. Well, maybe he was. That honestly would explain a lot. Number seven, party hard. Zhu Huzhao was the emperor of the Ming Dynasty in the early 1500s. Now, lately we've been talking about kings and queens, we're on part twos for both now, and there's a good amount who simply just aren't ready. They're too young to rule. Like Joffrey from Game of Thrones, kings like that actually existed. They were horrible. They were young, they were too young to know what was right and wrong. Plus, they usually have some corrupt parents whispering in their ears the entire time. Zhu took the throne at just age 14, and for a while, ministers were confident that he would grow into the role and become the leader that he was born to be. Well, when he got older, he transformed a zoo just outside of Beijing. He transformed it into his own personal brothel. Yum. I mean, on one hand, I'm glad the animals are free, but like, a zoo? You couldn't find a more romantic place? Can convert an Applebee's to a brothel, maybe? I don't know, something with AC? His final days were spent partying, and some would say a little bit too hard. He got intoxicated and fell from a boat. That's how he ended his life. Honestly, not a bad way to go out. Pretty OG. At number six, love game. A lot of kings and queens throughout history have been known to engage in the horizontal hustle a lot. I mean, when you're a ruler of a kingdom, you don't really have much to do in your spare time. So what else are you gonna do? Play a board game? No. These monarchs were getting busy all the time, but there was one king who was just so obsessed with getting a good old pickle tickle that it just became his whole personality. King Philip V was known to be a nymphomaniac, and he liked doing the deed a lot, but because at the time, the Catholic Church said that having sexy time with anyone but your spouse was a sin, the king and his wife were getting busy all the time. Eventually his first wife caught on to how to use this to her advantage and she would often refuse to sleep with him until she got her way with anything she suggested or demanded from him. You would think that he would catch on to this game but maybe his urges were just so strong because he always caved and gave her what he wanted. Obviously this man did not follow Hoodville. Absolutely not. Just to give you guys an idea of how obsessed this guy was, when his wife was on her deathbed, before she went eh, he literally tried to get one last bang in. On her deathbed. Like, dude, not the time. Number five, George V. 
We love hobbies here on Bumblebee. I mean, I used to collect special quarters growing up. I swear to God, the only time I've ever been good at saving money was when I was 12. I would see one of these and be like, mm, don't touch it. George V turned out he loved stamps. A lot, like a lot, a lot. Since he was a wee young lad, he was collecting these little guys. Here's the unusually impressive part about him though and his hobby. He continued to collect stamps during World War I. This guy was busy, everybody's trying to stay alive and George is just licking stamps in the library like a prince. Like all collections, it started at an early age and now it's at the point where it's past impressive and it's just borderline strange. This guy had albums on albums of stamps. He had around 330 albums, each with 60 pages full of stamps. Quick maths, that's like 20,000 pages full of stamps. So naturally he was nicknamed the king of stamps, or rather the king of philately, the official term for collecting stamps. It's a nice word, philately. Back in 1905, he set an all-time stamp record, which I didn't even know that was the thing, and it was the most money ever spent on a single stamp. The guy dropped like 220,000 US on a single stamp. Somebody even asked the prince down the road if he had heard about this idiot who spent 1,400 pounds on a stamp, and he was proud of it. He was like, that was me, that was me, you wanna see it? The next King George is a little different, to say the least. At number four, Womanizer. I'm going to preface this by saying that George IV of England was voted as England's worst king by historians, so that should already tell you a lot about this guy. Georgie here was yet another one of those monarchs who was a little too invested in his intimate conquests, you know? Now we do know that the encounters that he was on were all consensual, so that's a plus. However, he was still creepy about it, yeah. This man tried everything to get a woman to sleep with him, he would throw a tantrum if she said no, or threaten to end his life if he didn't get to do the eight-legged nature dance, you know? Somehow, this had a pretty good success rate, even though he was not a catch at all. It feels like this was one of those situations where you kinda just give in to make him stop talking, you know? Anyways, this guy was super creepy, because on top of the lengths that he would go to just to get some time in the sack, he also kept trophies of his conquests. He would ask each of the people he slept with for a lock of their hair, and he kept them all. Back then, it was kind of common for lovers to keep locks of each other's hair, but George's collection was alarming because of just how many locks of hair there were. After the king died, his brothers found 7,000 envelopes, each with a lock of hair that was, quote, enough to stuff a sofa, end quote. Fun fact, if you want to see this insane collection, it is in a museum in Scotland, so check that out if you want, I guess. Number three, kleptomania part two. On our spoiled queens list, Brie mentioned Queen Mary and how she just couldn't stop stealing, which is hilarious to me, just this old lady stealing your Well, the last king of Egypt also had sticky fingers. He was even better at it too, check this out. Farouk I was the youngest son of Egypt's first king, Fouad I. Now born in 1920 in Alexandria and in his early days at school, he couldn't concentrate. The king sent him to England even after to hopefully find a better way of teaching, something that works for him, but still it was to no avail. Once the king passed away in 1936, Farouk then got the throne, but also so much property and so much money. He had hundreds of fancy cars, 75,000 acres of land, this guy had it all. Literally, he had anything he could think of, but still, he felt like he needed to take more, to steal. At 17 years old, he would slam 12 eggs for breakfast and then wash it down with 30 bottles of beer. Nutritious and delicious. Horrible. On top of the fact that he loved to steal, he was the biggest hoarder. So he had thousands of shirts, randomly. He also had 50 diamond studded walking sticks for some reason. And like a prince such as myself, he too collected coins. I mean, his collection was much nicer, but still, great minds think alike. Spoiled minds think alike, rather. Oh shit, this is eye opening. One of the most bizarre facts about Farouk was he pickpocketed Winston Churchill once. He took the guy's watch. After everything I just said, he still decided to steal his watch. What a gem. We love him. We have At number two, the king of pettiness. Let's talk about a ruler that the Indian state of Alwar has described as controversial. If his own people are calling him controversial, then you know something's up. And boy, you better strap in because you're in for a wild ride with this one. Maharaja Jai Singh was pretty eccentric in a pretty dark way. He was known to have a temper and act on impulse, and he did some very questionable and downright scary things. He was known to be very competitive and hated to lose. One time, while playing polo, he and his team lost, and so in retaliation, he blamed the horse he was using and made the horse get extra crispy. He uh, fired his horse. I'm sure you know where I'm going by that. If not, 
use your noodle, I don't know. Unfortunately, the cruelty towards living things didn't stop in animals, and he was also known to kidnap women from the streets and go all criminal minds on them. On a slightly lighter note, though, the Maharaja was also known to be very petty. Once he went into a Rolls Royce dealership, and the person working there thought that he was broke and ignored him. Thinking that this was insanely rude, he bought seven Rolls Royces, sent them back to India, and used them to pick up garbage. This guy was really just doing the absolute most. And coming in at our number one spot, King Ludwig II. Home renovation shows rock my world. I can watch, love it, or list it for months at a time. It's the dream, building your own home one day, and if you're a king, well, it's pretty easy to get that done. In our Spoiled Queens part two, I mentioned a princess that had a house made of ice, literal ice. Well, King Ludwig II had numerous castles built to resemble fairy tales, literally, like, fairy tales. I gotta admit, I kind of love this a lot. Ludwig was only 18 when he became the king of Bavaria in 1864, and then he had castles, like castles, more than one, built after he was inspired from romantic literature and spending some time at the opera. The kid was a dreamer, you gotta love it. He would spend his nights in one castle looking through a telescope at his new castle being built, so he would just watch it all night. That's like the king's way of waiting for your Amazon delivery, just standing there just like, it's coming. 17 years and it's done. Just four years in, he designed his own castle and to this day, it's one of the most photographed places in the world. Neutrenstein Castle. Go check it out. It's literally a paradise. At number 10, blinded by ambition. I don't know about you, but I think my favorite part of these queens list is learning about all the wild and crazy things that queens did to keep or acquire power back in the days of old. Like these gals were absolutely ruthless and they weren't afraid to absolutely body anyone who stood in their way. We've heard about queens taking out enemy tribes, their husbands, and even their own family members. This all sounds like a round of Call of Duty when you're the last one on your team and you're just murking everyone in sight trying to save your own skin. Let's talk about a queen, or rather empress, who was so desperate for power that she ended up killing her own son. Irene of Athens was an empress from the Byzantine Empire who ruled from 797 to 802 CE. She started her reign as co-ruler alongside her son, Emperor Constantine IV. Though it started as a good old family business, you know, saving people, hunting things, not really. Things went south as they normally did back then. Irene wanted all the power to herself and so she sought out to eliminate her competition, her own son. Irene lured her son into the very room that he was born in and gouged his eyes out. Like ma'am, this is not ice cream. You can't just scoop eyeballs out and make a sundae out of them. Thank you. That's not how that works. <laughs> Constantine ended up dying as a result of his injuries and since his own heir had passed away earlier that year, the transition of power ended up going to Irene who became emperor. Yes, emperor, not empress, because she was the sole ruler, making her the first woman to do so. Number nine. Topless duels. Yeah, you heard me. Hungarian princess Pauline von Metternich was married to Prince Clemens, but she was born in 1836 and she had to marry her uncle when she was 20 years old. So, surprise, surprise, she was unhappy. Who knew? Weird, right? Since the marriage began, her husband was involved in numerous affairs. He liked going after actresses or singers, anyone glamorous or hot or cool. He barely paid any attention to her. That is until, you know, she started to have fun, live a life maybe. Yeah, once she got over this gross prince, she had a great time. She drank, she smoked, she partied, she defined convention, but most notably, her duel in the summer of 1892. She challenged another royal, a countess of the matter, to a duel and nothing but a corset. Now, to this day, it's not yet determined who exactly won this duel is corset poke off but a princess dueling in the dark after some drinks that should be a musical not frozen get out of here at number eight no side bays a bad relationship can really mess you up anyone who's been through a bad breakup can tell you that not as many people carry that pain with them as much as Catherine de medici did back in the day her didn't even begin to describe how she felt and she really embodied the pain that she was feeling after having her heart broken she basically turned into the type of person that was like if i'm not happy no one else is gonna be happy either Catherine's husband, Henry II of France, had a mistress, and Catherine was well aware of it. They had been having an affair for basically the whole time Catherine was married to Henry, and he loved his mistress more than he ever loved his wife. When Henry was on his deathbed, his final request was to see his mistress one last time, and as a final F you to her husband, not only did she deny the mistress from visiting Henry, but she literally made him die alone with no one by his side when he kicked the bucket. On top of this hatred towards her husband, though, Catherine Catherine was also an absolute B-word to her daughter as well. Catherine would fight her daughter over her 
her romantic affairs. I guess she didn't want her daughter to be like her father. Either way, Catherine got so mad about one of her daughter's affairs that when she found out about her lover, she locked her daughter away in a castle and never saw her again. Talk about a serious grudge. Number seven. Two for one. When you're deemed the most beautiful woman in all the realm of England and the most loving, well, odds are you're going to need two husbands. All that love to give, it only makes sense. Joan of Kent was named as such, and at the age 12, so gross, she was married for the first time. She fell in love with a knight named Thomas Holland. Yeah, she dated Tom Holland, the knight Spider Man guy. That's great. He was 26 and she was 12, still gross, but they got married in secret. She knew her parents wouldn't be on board. He was broke, and yeah, he was also 26. So so for obvious reasons, it had to be a little hush-hush. Even in royal standard, that's a bit odd. After the wedding, Thomas had to go off to war, and he wasn't gone for too long before, well, she remarried. The son of the Earl of Salisbury slid into her DMs, and Joan thought Tom Holland's Spider Knight was dead. Well, Thomas returned, like he did in Endgame, but they were legal issues now. Ultimately, Joan and Thomas got together and had four children, but after Thomas did die, Joan became the first ever Princess of Wales. So if you love someone, just, you know, marry them. Even if the other person's still just over there, just marry them both, see what happens. At number six, apple of his eye. I feel like this queen I'm about to tell you about needs to have her own movie made about her or something because the things she did for power were almost unbelievable. I would say that I would want to be her when I grow up, but she's kind of responsible for the deaths of a lot of people, and that's not really something I'm striving for, you know? But she did have a lot of determination. I will give her that. Isabella was married to King Edward II of England, and though she was quite the catch, Isabella wasn't really all that jazzed about him. She was like, meh, I guess I'll be your wife, even though back then she really wouldn't have a choice in the matter anyway. Anyways, after 10 years of marriage and the birth of an heir, things seemed to be relatively okay between the king and queen. That is, until the king started getting all buddy-buddy with his friend Hugh Dispenser, who was a much hated noble. Very hated. Hated numero uno. Isabella didn't like the bromance that was forming and she was like, uh, no, the only person who gets the king's attention is me. So she rallied the support of the other nobles, banished the Dispenser family, burned their castles to the ground, claimed their possessions, and killed anyone who supported the disgraced family. After all of that went down, she took refuge in the Tower of London, where she met a prisoner whom she smuggled to France. Then she got her husband to bring their son to France. And from there, with the support of the nobles and the common people, she was able to defeat her husband and the dispensers and became queen regent until her son Edward III came of age to become king. After all of that, she finally got her away. I hope she slept well that night because she did the most. Number five, rebel princess. Princess Leia wasn't the only rebel, okay? Princess Margaret partied with rock stars during the 60s. The queen's younger sister was known as the rebel princess. She was seen for years and years as this, well, bad. She passed away in 2002, but even to this day, we're trying to piece together her love life. Pablo Picasso actually wanted to marry her at one point. How fun is that? Also, side note, I didn't realize how recent Pablo Picasso died. That was alarming to find out. Guess my whole life's a lie. Her wedding was the first to be aired on TV. That's quite a big deal. The first televised royal wedding took place on May 6, 1960. In 1968, just eight years after, word had spread that the princess had an affair at a nightclub with pianist Robin Douglas Holm, who only a year and a half later took his own life. Adds a lot of mystery there. Then come 1973, the paparazzi got photos of her with a landscape gardener on her private island. One of the more unusual facts surrounding Princess Margaret was that she was cremated, believe it or not. She had chosen to break tradition so that her ashes could be shared in the same tomb as her father. How sweet is that? These acts are unusual when it comes to royalty, but Margaret also supported more than 80 charity organizations. But even then, media still focused on her love life. Classic. Keep it up. At number four, Warrior Queen. Let's talk about Queen Rainy Lakshmi Bai and how she became known as India's Joan of Arc. Rainy was a fighter her whole life. She was raised to be a warrior and was taught how to fight. She even shared her skills with other women, teaching them the same fighting skills at a young age. She was married off to a much older man and she had a child, but she lost them both pretty early on. In need of an heir, she adopted a son and served as queen regent, but soon a growing conflict started causing a lot of tension between the British East Indian Company and her people. The young queen, at just 22 years old, wanted to drive British forces out of her land, and so she organized a revolt that turned bloody very quickly. She ordered the execution of literally every British person in the region. So Bobby from down the street, dead. Mary from around the block, goner. Freddie and Harriet, the kids of that guy that you know who bought shoes off your brother, bye bye. 
gone. Rainy killed every man, woman, and child in the area. But it still wasn't enough to win against the British. The Queen died on the battlefield, and the British ended up winning the battle, and the kingdom fell to the enemy forces. This Queen was one of the bravest and most determined women in history, and she's still remembered as a hero. Number three, Chelonis. The reason we look at princesses like Margaret and say she was a rebel is because most of the time these marriages are chosen. Well, rather, women are forced to marry some gross fat dudes. And while he's cheating and eating lobster, the wife has to have his kids and be dutiful. So for the Spartan princess from the third century, she too was forced to marry Cleonymus, this older, horrible man. He was so horrible that he wasn't even allowed to have his father's throne. That's how bad he was. He was in the family and still they're like, no. So Chelones thought, this guy sucks, the system sucks, I'm gonna go talk to the much more pleasant Archytatus, son of King Eris the first. Around 272 BC, both these guys, both her lovers, went to war with each other. Mm, drama. How about the tea on that? Chelonis was preparing to hang herself in case her husband won. That's horrible. Now, luckily, he lost, therefore the princess this time around did really live happily ever after with her other man. That's like an R-rated version of Shrek 2, what I just said. I can't believe people had to go through this in real life. That's horrible. At number two, toxic cosmetics. The price of beauty is pretty steep. These days, people spend hundreds and hundreds of dollars on makeup to make themselves feel beautiful. But back in the day, makeup not only cost a pretty penny, but it also cost some serious health concerns. Cosmetics were made of a lot of questionable ingredients that you probably wouldn't find in today's products, but for people like Queen Elizabeth I, she didn't care what she was putting on her skin, so long as she not only looked like a snack, but the whole damn meal. Yeah. Elizabeth had pitting in her skin from when she contracted smallpox at the age of 29, and back then, having blemished skin was a sign that God was a little cheesed with you. Or that you were having some wild thoughts like thinking about the sexy time uwu. It was thought that these thoughts bubbled up from your no-no square up to your face and showed everyone that you were sinning. Anyways, to cover up the blemishes, Elizabeth wore a lot of makeup, like her version of foundation, but the ingredients were really just making things worse and not better. The foundation was made with a tincture of white lead ore, vinegar, and sometimes arsenic, hydroxide, and carbonate. To add some color back to her face after applying this pasty white mask, she powdered cinnabar to her lips and cheeks, but this was pretty dangerous because it contained mercury. She did this every day, and as you can imagine, it wasn't good for her health at all. Imagine absorbing all of those chemicals through your face on a daily basis. Not cute. And finally, number one. Are you not entertained? Back in the late 1800s, the name Clara Ward would stir up a conversation. She was famous, really famous, for all the wrong reasons, of course. All it took was her bumping into a European royal and Bob's your uncle. Since birth, Clara was born into money. She didn't even need a royal husband. She was born into a wealthy industrialist family. She would sometimes visit the family mills, you know, to make it look good and kind of be like, hey, how's everyone doing? Whatever, just casual visit. But on this one casual visit, she crossed paths with the Prince of Caraman Chimay. He was there for trade, but when he left, he brought back a wife. Carry on, also, meet my wife. Here she is. People were freaking out, obviously. A royal marrying a common American girl. Wow, how could you? She was the talk of the town. Unlike Meghan Markle, Clara loved to show off with her newfound wealth. Some loved her and her image, but others not so much. The marriage only lasted six years. Clara eloped with a Hungarian musician. Then after her divorce, she had to model to make a living rather than showing off for clout. At number 10, kleptomania. If you were a queen, then you would think that you had enough money to just buy whatever your little heart desired. Though that may be true, there was at least one famous queen who just straight up stole things just because she could. Queen Mary, Queen Elizabeth's grandmother, was quite the kleptomaniac, and no matter how hard people tried to avoid having their things stolen by her, it just never worked. When the queen would visit someone's house, she would walk around looking at whatever knickknacks you had lying around, and when she found something that she liked, she would stand there and just sigh super loudly to get someone's attention. Much like how my dog used to sigh dramatically when he wanted food. Anyways, usually when someone heard the sigh, they knew that this was a sign that the queen wanted whatever she was gazing upon. Sometimes the homeowner would just give whatever it was to the queen as a gift, gift, but if it was something that they weren't willing to part with, then she would either try to buy it off them or just straight up take it when no one was looking. This became such a big problem that people started hiding their prized possessions before hosting the queen in their home, but she eventually caught on to this strategy, so she just started showing up uninvited. She could not rest until she owned pretty much everything in the kingdom. Number nine, no time to dine. 
If I'm eating, don't acknowledge me as a human being. I sound like a pug when I eat, okay? I don't waste any time. I love food, okay? It's business. Now, if you're a queen and you eat fast, well, everybody else has to eat fast as well. This began back in Queen Victoria's time. The queen loved to feast and she didn't waste any time at all. Like, it's really fast. The way the royal family works is that when the queen is done that course or that meal, you're also done. So when Queen Victoria would smash an entire seven course meal in 30 minutes, which apparently she could do easily, you'd be blowing on your soup still and Queen Victoria would already be telling everybody to pack it up. That's stressful. All because she could eat lots of food in a short amount of time. Also, once the queen gave a toast, you couldn't even speak. Also, once the queen placed her cutlery on the table, regardless of where you were during that course, everybody's plate would then be taken away at the same time. And the next one would then come in. I would just put my food in my pockets, you know? Screw it. It's almost like when you go to all you can eat sushi and you have like some sushi left over, you don't want to waste it. You're like, you know what? I'm not paying that bill. At number eight, cross-dressing. Empress Elizabeth was quite the character, I guess you could say. Since she was a monarch, she could do whatever she wanted, and that is exactly what she did. You see, she was quite into fashion, more specifically, men's fashion. The Empress believed that she just had legs for days, like Naomi Campbell, and she wanted to show them off to the world, but the only problem with that was the fact that back then, pants were reserved for men, and so since she wore dresses all the time, no one got to see her godly legs. Well, to combat that, Elizabeth came up with a solution. She was known to hold huge parties where everyone had to cross-dress. She only did this so that it would give her an excuse to wear pants. And I mean, she could have if she just wanted to wear them on a regular day, but she didn't want to be the only woman in men's clothing, so she made everyone else dress up too. At these parties, no one looked good or really enjoyed themselves for that matter. Women complained that the men's clothing they wore to these parties were unflattering, and the men were just all over the place because they didn't know how to maneuver a hoop skirt. The only person really having a fun time was Empress Elizabeth, but I guess that was really the whole point. Number seven, check on the dead. Funerals are pretty expensive, especially a royal one at that. It takes a lot of power to dig up and then carry these massive caskets around, which back in the day was even more exhausting. Joanna of Castile was born in 1479. Her marriage to the Duke of Austria was arranged, but she was very much in love, maybe a bit too much, hear me out. When her husband met his fate in 1506 due to typhoid fever, Joanna would have his tomb unearthed and then opened over and over again, just so she could make sure that he was still there. Now, of course, I feel bad for the queen here. She was clearly not coping with his death well, but to have his tomb or casket or coffin, whatever you want to call it, to have it opened and closed over and over and then dug up and then put back in the ground, she would make people carry his body around everywhere she went. That's heavy. That is so much work. Even keeping it under her bed sometimes. Ugh, I got goosebumps just saying that. That's pretty creepy. Ashes, I could understand. That's like a one-man job to carry that around. But a thousand pound royal coffin? They have to carry 30 city blocks? My back already hurts thinking of that. No thank you, I quit. At number six, deadly affairs. Dating is hard. If you've ever been on dating apps like Tinder or Bumble, then you know that things aren't as easy as it may seem when it comes to finding someone that you remotely like. Maybe we should take a page out of Queen Nzinga's book when it comes to dating because it seemed like she had fun with her escapades. Well, maybe don't actually do what she did because it's actually pretty gruesome, but you get what I'm saying. Queen Nzinga from what is now modern day Angola was a busy woman. After taking over the throne from her brother, she juggled the monarchy, wars with the Portuguese, and having a love life. The queen pulled together a harem of only the most attractive men, but because she was such a busy person, she didn't really have the time to walk into a room and choose who she was going to sleep with that night, so she came up with an alternative solution. Nzinga would have two members of her harem fight each other to the death every night, and whoever won got to sleep with the queen. Solid plan, right? Well, the winner wasn't really all that lucky for too long, because she would have the winner executed the following day. Number five, diamond scandals. Queen Mary wasn't the only queen with sticky fingers, it seems. The affair of the diamond necklace has sparked many conversations. France's queen from 1774 to 1792 was Marie Antoinette, and if that name sounds familiar to you, it's because she was the last queen before the French Revolution. She was also known for spending a buck on jewelry. She liked 
She liked the diamonds. Now this Countess de Lamotte was this young lady, a friend of the Queen, supposedly, who entered the French court in 1785. Now she got somebody to disguise herself as the Queen and then she acted like she was in love with this high society member, all to get her hands on this $12 million necklace. Now she said that she would pay, but never ended up paying a dime, so that's horrible by itself. And the Queen supposedly had no idea about any of this or what happened to the necklace. Although this countess pretended to be her friend beforehand. The public went on to hate her for this, not believing in the scandal of course. One of the most notable lines from Marie Antoinette was when the French spoke out for not being able to afford bread. She apparently said, well let them eat cake which led into the French Revolution and ultimately her demise. Shine bright like a diamond, I guess. At number four, test drives. Catherine the Great of Russia was well known for a number of things. She was known for being a good leader, a strong ruler, and surprisingly for her naughty bedroom fun times as well. She was well known for her adventures in baby making, and there was once a rumor that she did the deed with a horse. Obviously that wasn't actually true, however she did do it with a lot of men. The only problem that she really faced when it came to finding a new partner was actually having the time to do so. I mean, it's not like she could swipe through Tinder while sitting on her throne, right? What was most important to her was finding a new lover who was skilled in the sack, and she didn't really want to waste time on testing these guys out, so she had someone else do it for her. Catherine had a friend take her potential partner out on a test drive, so to speak, so that she wasn't wasting her time on someone who couldn't meet her standards. Remember, she is a very busy woman. It is said that on a couple of occasions, Catherine's tester friend was caught in bed with Catherine's partner again, well after the Empress was with him, and that made things a little complicated, but I imagine that they got past that. Or at least I really hope they did. Number three, change religion. Ruling alongside the pharaoh Akhenaten from 1353 to 1336, Queen Nefertiti aka Lady of Grace aka the Lost Queen of Egypt was only 15 years old when she married 16 year old Akhenaten. Now alongside her new young husband she built an entirely new capital city called Amarna and ruled over what's now considered the wealthiest period in ancient Egyptian history. But when it comes to spoiled queens or rather queens who could do anything they believe with their power we have to mention the queen that changed Egypt religion. Both her and her co-ruler were in a cult, the cult of the sun god, Aton. In the earliest accounts of the queen, she assisted her husband in a ritual that smited the female enemies of Egypt at the time, and there have been a few blocks that have since been recovered from the Thibian tombs of the royal butler that depicts the queen wearing her unique blue crown, part of the sun god rituals. So now cut to the end of the king's ruling, the Aton was now Egypt's main god. Some queens change laws, others change religion. At number two, fake village. Imagine being so privileged and so disconnected from the world that you pretend to be poor for fun. Well, that's pretty much what Marie Antoinette did. This French queen was known for her lavish and opulent lifestyle, and that's really the only life that she knew. Apparently, living the life of a rich queen started to get a little boring for her, and she wanted to find an escape, and so she got her people to build a fake village for her so that she could pretend to be a commoner. This fake village included 11 cottages, a lake, a water mill, a working dairy, a windmill, a barn, and other quote unquote peasant buildings. Maria apparently loved this little peasant village and she would bring other people to enjoy it too. When she brought her guests to the village, she expected them to yes and their way through the day and really immerse themselves into their role of a common person. She would even tell her ladies to ditch the ball gowns and wear something simple to blend in. Marie even took her kids to the fake village to teach them about farming. Even though she loved her pretend peasant lifestyle, it still didn't help her bond with the real common people, and it certainly didn't save her from the guillotine. And finally, coming in at a number one spot, surprise entrance. The last true pharaoh of Egypt, Cleopatra VII, ruled from 69 to 30 BC. She's known mainly for her love interests, of course, her two mans, Mark Anthony and Julius Caesar. And to this day, we're still trying to uncover more dazzling details of the lost queen. Now, she ruled alongside her young brother, and her life was much more than being just beautiful, which is what everyone seems to focus on more than anything. Both children were assigned to the throne, Cleopatra being 18 and little bro being 10 years old. So Cleopatra, being a little older, therefore a little wiser, became the ruler. A couple of years passed and eventually Cleopatra was pushed out of Alexandria over her greed for power, classic, but her little brother, equally a co-ruler, had her driven out. He was jealous, and honestly, I'm the youngest in my family, I kinda get it. 
But Cleopatra wasn't quite done yet. She had a few tricks up her sleeve. Believing she was the goddess Isis, reborn, this beautiful goddess, Cleopatra made these dazzling entrances whenever she could. Most notably in 48 BC, right when Caesar arrived in Alexandria during that family feud with Ptolemy VIII. She wanted to meet the Roman general, but she couldn't be seen because it was a little bit of family beef. So she had herself wrapped up in a linen sack and then personally delivered to Caesar's bedroom. Hashtag your order has arrived. Surprise. Now she won the heart of Rome's future dictator here, obviously, and eventually she regained Egypt's throne. Her brother wasn't too fond of this alliance, and in the following battle, he drowned in the Nile River, resulting in Cleopatra's return to power. 